this depicts me learning a new technique and just playing with paint yesterday this is um, it's been around for a long time and actually I've been doing it more years than I want to remember um, with watercolors I just did not think about it doing the same kind of thing in acrylic even though last year I actually did one a painting with this technique but because I came about doing it so differently my approach was different and I just didn't think about it and I see all these people doing these pours and swirls and just literally selling the, the stuff that we do as side effects or background but they're beautiful I love them um, the difference is this is just yesterday's it hasn't been coated with anything clear so I'm going to put some clear glaze on it and because I use silicone oil I'm just learning about this stuff very interesting it just changes um, there's actually a physics law about it what it does is may basically help the little bubbles come up and break through one color layer of color to expose another layer of color so it's um oh uh, well <clears throat> I'm addicted to my computer computerized things anyway this year I became addicted to my phone 
Before that, it was only for phone calls. This year, I started playing games on it, and um, that's a mistake. I did keep Facebook off it, because I try to stay off Facebook anyway. Um, don't access Twitch through it, although, because I will occasionally do a weird cooking show, and my phone is now capable of handling the video and sound, um, I do have Twitch on my phone. I just don't go there. So, welcome. My uh, This is my 15th year of broadcasting or streaming, or whatever we call it. The first 13 years was strictly as a... Um, a card reader teaching people how to read cards for themselves to te teaching them to create their life not wait for someone to tell them what it's going to predict no predictions all about learning to predict your own future so um i still do that but now that's more on the side because the two years ago i made painting my number one priority and helping people second so um because Sunday is the only co absolutely consistent day I will be here. Every other day I may or may not be here. So I took myself off the schedule. Um, I tried to use Sunday to start with some inspiring stuff. Yes, I have been streaming. I was um, on blog TV with a show called Intuitube where I was teaching people how to be their own best psychics because I was working on a psychic line as a five-star psychic. And I was trying to explain to people that there's nobody who's really psychic. We are really, we have a lot of other things about us that has nothing to do with anything supernatural. You know, it's got to do with life experience and education and level of intelligence. Our ability to read a, a room. Um, I was an entertainer as a singer for years and years and songwriter. I learned to read a room. Now, video is way different. I can't read a room unless I can see your actual words on a screen because I don't see your faces and your body language and how you're dressed and all that other stuff. But if you're on stage, you do see all that. And when you're doing readings with people in person, you see all that. And Anyway, people were getting burned for many, many thousands of dollars, and it's a multi-billion dollar industry, psychic stuff. And um, I never really cared too much about other people doing readings. You know, it's like you do your thing, I do mine. I know what a kind of a spiritual advisor I hope to be to people, but I'm not going to tell you how to be. But then when I worked online and saw the websites, and it was like, oh my God. But before that, even... Um, I was working in a group as a reader and I got some really bizarre calls. So I called my manager, my group, and she was trying to reassure me that we were still a ethical small group, but the truth was she'd sold out. Um, all these little groups are selling out. As soon as they had enough psychics and readers who wanted to help people together, they sold out to Keen and AT&T and everybody who owns those bigger conglomerations. Exactly, exactly. You learn to read people because you're working with people so much. I, I did very well in retail, but I did well because I loved what I was selling and I couldn't sell anything I didn't believe in because the eyes can't lie, you know? Um, there's just something I can't do to people. It's, I can't just take their money for some piece of shit. So I was very ethical in my work and I developed a following in a retail store. So I love working with people. So I'm a good psychic, psychic in quotations. Um, the thing is, it's not important what other people are predicting. What's important is what you are predicting for yourself. The rest of the world can fuck off. It's not about the rest of the world. Your life is for you. You're here for your adventure, your way. You have to honor that. You've got to learn how to honor it. And unfortunately, so many people are terrified of the future, and that's why they seek out psychics and card readings and all that. So when I started reading cards, I was three years old. My grandmother taught me. 
So I always saw this as a God's given ability, but what it really was, was my grandparents spoke more than eight languages. They were always fighting and they didn't want me to understand what they were fighting about. So they spoke and fought in different languages. Me being stuck with them day in and day out uh, for my first few years, I had to learn to read them without language. So, of course I got intuitive. It was just the natural response of a human being in an environment that was indecipherable from a child's point of view. So I got good at reading cards because I was reading people. But the cards will do what you ask to a great deal. I mean, they're a storyteller, you know? And um, I am literally a storyteller. I, I'm actually working on my third book right now, so I'm a good reader. It's no wonder I was a five-star reader. But people have to understand that five-star reader ability is within themselves and stop seeking it outside of themselves. I'm turning to websites and books and cards. And, and I have 35 decks of cards. I'll be happy to pull one out and... Uh, give you a card. That's what I did for the years online. So the first show was Intuitube, where I was literally teaching people, showing them different books, how to educate themselves about their own physical and if they want to call it psychic energy. Wow, that's amazing. Yes, all kinds of cards. I don't do full card full tarot readings online. I certainly wouldn't do it for free anymore. But I did readings for free until I was in my 20s, mid-20s. And then I charged $2 for a reading. Um, my grandparents were from Poland, and they spoke all of the local languages, Russian, um, Hungarian, Polish. English was their last one. I do not remember all the other languages because they were... Like I said, they switched languages. Oh, of course, they also spoke Yiddish. Um, I don't know because I didn't speak any of those languages. I understood Yiddish to a degree. I spoke the English, of course. Well, for yourself, always. That's the, that's the point, you see. Tarot cards especially your traditional reading of 10 cards, is a system of reading a specific deck called tarot, which is 73 cards. It's got a major arcana, which you can read cards, you do readings just with the major arcana. You can also do it just with the minor arcana, which is identical to your regular playing deck. Um, then you start adding your people cards and all that. So anyway, tarot is all that. And it tells a story basically the hero's journey, the beginning to the end of an event, a project, a life. But when you are um, reading these, they all, every position of the card has meaning. Like you, the first one represents the person being read. The one on top of it represents the issue that they have come to get insight into or something that's affecting the issue in a big way. So it's, it's, um, it's wonderful for storytelling, but if you want to be a good tower reader, you're going to have to learn to be a good storyteller. You need to be able to take all the stories of each card and weave them into a story. And literally in a beginning and an ending, the final outcome. So when you are doing card readings for yourself, this is a problem many readers have because they're silly. And because they're human, we want to see the best for our, ourselves. So when we, I had one of my sisters used to do her cards every single morning and I used to pull a card every single day, but she would do a whole layout and I kind of used it like a predictor for her day. Problem was if she had a bad reading or nonsensical reading and she couldn't come together with a story in her head for it, she had a sucky day because she put too much into it. And then she started doing what most readers will do. They'll shuffle the deck and do another reading. And then another and another, and they will keep doing cards until they get the reading that agrees with them. 
And what that is really saying, um, well, people are afraid of the future. Young girls are interested in matters of the heart and security. Um, and of course, so much is reflected in whatever your culture happens to be. But the reason people will do the cards over and over again to find the the uh, results they want to see is because while they're doing it, it's disagreeing with their inner person who knows the truth. You will always know the truth. Ask and you will know the truth like that or within a few seconds or sometimes at worst because you're resisting it a day or so. That's why I say sleep on something. You predict it because you're creating your own future moment to moment your beliefs, your vibration is attracting everything needed to create whatever you're vibing about. So if you are focused on cards to tell you what tomorrow will be, you're focused on the wrong thing. The cards do not tell you who you are and they can't tell you what to do. And that's why people used to come to me to find out what to do next. So it's, it can be therapeutic. I, the majority of my decks are not tarot. I have 35 decks that are not tarot. They're all about inspiring encouragement. It's hard being a human. It's hard navigating this world. There's no guarantee you're going to be born into a great situation with supportive, intelligent parents with a lot of money to get you the best of everything. It's just, the people that have that luck are the minority. Astrology is the same. It's just people trying to make sense of their world. The thing about astrology is literally there are 13, there are 13 signs now because of the way the stars have shifted since the beginning of the practice of astrology. So astronomers know we have a 13th designation, which means whatever you think you were born in, you're probably not. Everything has shifted. Where you're at in the new zodiac, um, well, what, what that means is that people who have been believing in 12 zodiac signs all of these centuries, including the Chinese, their Chinese calendar is awesome too, um, it means somebody's got to sit down and make up out of their head a new meaning, okay? They've got to adjust the entire practice. And honey, that's, that's just going to be a, a computer um, job because, or probably at this point, AI. Uh, why not let AI do all the math? They think it's scientific astrology. I don't go for it. If I was going to support a pseudoscience. I know that actually my beliefs are fall now falling under a pseudoscience, I guess. Um, my understanding of energy, but I see it as more scientific, just things that haven't been, theories that haven't been proven yet. So, but that's me, you know. I So I work with energy. I change energy. I'm aware that I create my future. And so I do everything I can, and also, yeah, because we can't control everything going on up here. We can't control the head, we can't control the heart and the energy, and so we, we have to learn to make them coherent. So that would be something I would get into. I would support math-based stuff. Numerology is intriguing. It's got probably the oldest history going back into the Kabbalah, but um, I'm not into that either, even though theoretically that was part of my culture. There are just things about my culture, early culture, I've already, I discarded by the time I was 15 years old, so I can't even remember them clearly anymore. Yeah, yeah, astrology is, when people are really into it, don't cross them, they get really upset. So if their belief system is working for them, it works for them. It, for working for the rest of the world, no. Um, 
it, the point is, your personal belief system is going to help you create your world, your entire world, your future, every day of it. You're going to attract things that you focus on. I was, I was musing that um, one that is overall harmless, a belief that I took on somewhere in my reading about health stuff years ago. And this morning before I came to the table, I was going to talk about this exact thing. We get imprinted with ideas from the time we're born. That's how we learn about our world, right? So somewhere, anywhere along your life, anything you read, study here, over here, don't even pay much attention to, but it gets in the back of your brain somewhere. And when it's needed, it comes up and you don't even realize what, how it's affecting you. See, I got this belief, not meant to be a belief, I just read that somebody grew up with the idea that if you ate seven almonds every day, it would ward off some kind of illness. I don't remember what it was, but the idea was that stuck in the brain was seven almonds a day. It's a good thing. And that's how the brain reduces little bits of information over time. We compress the stuff that becomes less and less important. It's like, oh, just remember seven almonds a day is good. I cannot quite quote the source anymore. It's been that many years ago. So when I went to get almonds this morning, I took seven almonds and laughed at myself for numbering them. For actually counting my stupid almonds instead of just taking a handful or going by like a quarter cup a day. You know, I just, I counted seven damn almonds and I ate them. Yes. Well, the focus has to come emotionally. You have to feel it. You have to feel it as being real before it becomes real. And that's where people run into problems because our brains just keep regurgitating everything we've already thought, everything we've already known. So it's really no help there. You have to learn to feel your way. And it's not that all your, of your feelings will be correct because there too, we, we uh, train ourselves into having reactions that we confuse as feelings or they elicit feelings. So we have to learn to let go of all of that. It's really, it's a practice. It's just like every day when things come up, you don't get upset with yourself when you make a mistake in your thinking or actions. You just go, okay, all right. And then move on. Don't even give it any energy the past, if you, especially if you screwed up. But also don't get, get stuck in your self accolades, you know, I did that great. But that's better than putting yourself down always. Uh, way better. Think good of yourself. So I'm just going to get this out of the way. And the experiment with this now is to see how well this stuff dries um, over paint that has had um, a little bit of silicone oil added to it because silicone oil does not evaporate. That's why they use it in machines. Oh, well, you know, actually, no, I have never had leftover residue from silicone. Okay, now let's get this one. This one was an exercise in using my finger as the brush. So yeah, I'm all about energy and how we can better create our todays and tomorrows. So card reading and all of that, I don't do for myself because I'm not expecting things to be predicted for me, but I have learned to use myself, my inner self, to give myself signs. And I know it's coming from me. You see, that's the very important distinction. I recognize where the power is when this is concerned. This is my power. I am able to predict for myself. And for the joy of I, I, love, I grew to love cards. How could I not? My entire life, you know, I've been playing with cards. And ironically, my second husband, to whom I was married 22 years, 
Never played a single game of cards, so I had no outlet for my love of cards in a regular game of Remy or something. So, um, but I did card readings constantly. That's how I made my living. Um, when people called on me. And then, like I said, I got some stuff from back then. It was called the Miss Cleo Network. And I found out that my little group manager had sold us off for the benefit of getting more calls. We were now part of the Miss Cleo Network. And I started getting calls asking to speak to Miss Cleo because they got a card in the mail. And I'm going, why would they be calling me? I am not in the Miss Cleo Network. Oh, who the hell is Miss Cleo? I lived in a farm in the boondocks. I had no idea, no TV. I didn't know that this was the psychic network that was being advertised all the time. What types of cards I use? I'll show you. I'll give you an example today. Just let me get this stuff out of the brush because it'll destroy a brush. It dries that fast. Okay, I have three examples right off the top. The first one I started teaching with, and the first one on the show, the first show in Tuatube on Blog TV, I was there for three and a half years, and then they sold Blog TV to actually what is now Twitch. It was sold to, was it sold to Justin? It was a kid's channel. Maybe it was, no, it wasn't, it was UTV or U something else, but um, it was a kid's channel, so I needed to go elsewhere. So for the last, until I landed here on Twitch, I had I had three other shows. Um, and two of two, Celestial Tea Room. Oh God, what was the other one? Oh, Call Me Galen is my, uh, the latest one. And it was really going to be a channel to promote my writing, my books more than anything. But then I got into the painting and I didn't want to stop. Blog TV was the first one. Justin TV was a gamer's channel that Amazon bought and turned into Twitch. I did not join then because I wasn't a gamer and it really was focused on gamers because that had attracted a much younger crowd. I'm 70 years old. So I've been around a while. So this was the first deck I used on blog TV where my audience was extremely mixed and my mouth was strictly G rated because I realized that even 12 year olds were coming on, even though I said my channel was for 18 and out because I don't want parents coming to me thinking I'm trying to predict their kid's future or I've been accused of witchcraft and every other thing for doing cards for, you know, years ago. I don't want to go through that game, you know, I'm not doing anything of the sort, but um, people see what they want and that's why people need to beware of card readings because we see what we want to see. True or not? So trusting your vibes is the first thing I was teaching. Teaching you how to recognize your inner psychic, your intuition, your uh, third and fourth eyes. So yeah, kind of lean spiritual, but again, um, not religions, no religions. Well, hi. Hi, Raiders. Sorry you got to wait um, 10 minutes to talk, but it's a good time to come because I'm just talking. I am just showing our friend here, Shetty, cards. The cards I started doing online 15 years ago, teaching people about their inner self. And I highly recommend this deck for anybody who's seeking to be more psychic, it starts with you. 
Rain. Well, that is so sweet. I send you love and coffee. Or tea, if you prefer. So I'm going to go ahead and, and pull a card from Trust Your Vibes just so we can entertain y'all who just rated and can't talk yet. So when I was doing the show years ago, I used to have a pile of books next to me because I was teaching about energy, self-healing, um, and also physical healing, like trigger point stuff. Things that are useful tools for humans because it's hard being human. And it doesn't matter where on earth you are, you know? You're not born with a book you can read, like, this is human. It's just usually the books they hand you are the ones like, you learn this, this is who you are. And then you grow up finding out you're not, you're not that book. So um, you need to write your own book. Ah, okay, this is a good one. I know a lot of people don't like to exercise and other people make it their religion, but exercising your vibes is a real thing. When I was writing my first book, I lived out in the middle of nowhere, North Carolina, out in the boondock seven miles from the nearest main road. I guess we were a main road, but we went through the country the long way. Whenever I got the, what am I going to say next, or I felt uncomfortable about moving forward in the story, I went for a walk, which was handy because I had five dogs and they got walked three times a day. So twice a day, I went out with them and we would go up on the hill. And the more I walked and hiked up that hill, the more ideas just started popping in my head and scenes started happening. And... I'd find my excitement growing all, all over again, and I couldn't wait to get back down the hill so I can get back to the computer and start writing again. So when we need to get in touch with ourselves, if we have a question about what to do next in any area, get out. Do something physical. Get that blood pumping. Get all that oxygen to your brain. You will feel so much better, and... There's even something I saw in an exercise video that had me laughing, but I ended up joining a little class in our community to do exercises a couple days a week. I usually only make it once. But there's one little thing there that it's all seated because we're all old. It's like they, you're just getting your little feet tapping like... And I found like, oh, you know, actually that's kind of cool. You do that just for a minute, just get your feet tapping back. It's like... I don't know, just like stimulates your whole bottom half. So whatever you can do to get the oxygen moving through your body, it will inspire you and bring clarity. And you will at the end of this, you know, when you just chill, stop thinking that when you're out there doing some kind of walking around or being in nature or getting on whatever it turns you on, um, have some sex. All of that works. Just get that body in motion and things come more clearly. Okay, so that was the first book, uh, first, yeah, book, the first stuff I was teaching in the first show. Oh, yes, totally, totally helps with your intuition, totally helps inspiration. I got my best inspiration um, doing physical things. And if I don't have the physical wherewithal or the weather is really sucky, I will do things like just do that for a minute or... I'll sit down, I'll just run in place, which sounds silly, but it does get your body, uh, your blood moving. And that's the idea. If you don't want to end up with blood clots, move your body. Okay, so this is one of my favorites, the uh, teachings of Abraham. That's Abraham Hicks. They have, um, they put out three decks. One just for money, the law of attraction and money. And the teachings of Abraham well-being cards. And this was done while Jerry was still alive. That's Esther's husband. So these are just beautiful. And there's nothing that isn't positive. But they remind us that everything is really... There's no one side to anything. There's always two sides. The wanting of something and the lack of it. And it's very easy to get caught up in the feeling of the lack of something. It's like when, when people start carrying on about they, they want a lot of money, they want to win a lottery. Well, who doesn't want to win a lottery? But if you think that's going to just, like, you're going to win a lottery and then all of a sudden everything is going to be good, well, yeah, your immediate bills will get paid off and that'll be a load off your mind, but um, your life is going to change in 
radical ways and sometimes bad ways. So you never know what that's going to bring. But it's not the money itself. You're looking for relief, right? You're looking for, well, relief, financial relief, freedom that a lot of money would get you. But if you're thinking about that lottery as a cure-all and you're hungry for it that way, you're not going to ever win because you've already focused all of your energy really on the fear of not having the money. Oh, thank you. Well, I'm glad you rated. I like the company. So um, this is what I taught for the first 13 years. But I said the last two years, I underwent my own changes. Um, I was homeless for a while. And I was just uh, mentally, I was actually overall in a, well, right in the middle. I was going up, I was going down, I was having my moments, and um, I was really stuck in one little room for a while, and I could only paint on a small area, and, and my computer had to use that. I was like, even the decks of cards became a burden, because I have 35 decks, my show always had all of them available, so with anything you wanted, your heart desired, I had a list on my page here on Twitch, and you could choose. You know, whatever deck you want, I'll do a card for you. And I had a list, and I paid to have that little list thing. And I loved doing that. But then when I found myself um, going, every, every day I'm doing a show, I have to lift all of these cards up off the floor, which I had in the furniture. I just had an air mattress and a little folding table. So I had to, like, move everything up and off and up and forth. My back just could not take that anymore. And I said, you know what, I'm just going to sit here and doodle. And um, it just happened to be New Year's Eve when I got into that and I started making outrageous doodles. My friends that were coming every day were making some suggestions that were suggestive. And so I ended up doing uh, at least 13 doodles called cockadoodles. You might imagine what they might have included. I'll show them again someday. But... Um, Back to the cards. The point of the cards are not to predict, but to support you in focusing on what you want and the feeling of having what you want, happy about it, not being all upset that you don't yet have it. You have to believe it will come if you will believe it'll come. Believing is seeing when it comes to working with energy and the law of attraction. That's why people think it's all up here. Well, you can say things all day long. Um, positive affirmations are great to lift your, your energy a bit, but they're not the cure. They're not the action part. And there's not going to be an action part until your energy gets up there enough to attract the inspiration for your next move. So this is why cards are fun, but they're not going to tell you your next move. You have to feel your next move or you're going to make a wrong move. It may be okay, it comes out in the end, but it could have been better if you followed your initial feeling about it. So this is, so cut to the, to the quick, the measure of my success is my joy. Whether it's winning a lottery or finishing a painting or finding true love, even if it's temporary. These are successes and they make you feel good. So feeling good is what you're going after. It's not the money. It's what money can do for you that would make you feel good. Love. It's because it makes you feel good. Yes. Exactly. When you are feeling good, you will get more inspirations for ways to feel even better. It will just, momentum will go in any direction. That's why it's like, if you spend too much time thinking about something negative in the past, you start to emote about that, all right? You start to feel it again. You can even get your, if you were embarrassed and you remember how you felt when you were embarrassed and your cheeks get red, you just fucked up big time, all right? What you just did in that was, you put out this powerful attraction to experience the same feeling. So that's what we're talking about. It's the feeling that things evoke. If you do something that feels bad, you're going in the wrong direction. Absolutely. Um, the saying here is never say yes 
when you feel no, whether it's going along with somebody else's plan or something that popped up in your face and you've got to deal with it, never say yes to anything when you feel in your body you're like no. Listen to the no. That's going to save you a lot of trouble. And love does feel good. That's why we always want, we're loving creatures. We come from love. It's our, it's our natural state of being. And anytime we come up against something that is not love, we feel it and we get angry, we get frustrated, we react. And that takes us further off the course of love. So we have to remind ourselves. So the cards are reminders basically they're not telling you what to do but they're suggesting things like the amount of joy you have allowed yourself to experience is the greatest indicator of your allowance of energy and success that's why feeling good to feel even better is why we're all about feeling good whenever you are feeling good you're an enormous successful contributor your joy contributes to the world so if you want to feel better and you want to be more successful, you want to attract more great stuff in your life, you have to learn to feel that way and not keep going back to your fails because that's how we learn is through failure. Bless the failures. There isn't a failure that you've experienced that hasn't taught you something. You learn more from the failures. So get ready to fail, all right? But don't aim for it, that's all. So another kind of deck, Roger Van Oak's creative whack pack we have two of these decks that's all he ever put out this is not about um, relying on your intuition yes yes the mind will lead you anywhere the mind will fuck with you the mind is in conflict the mind has ego involved it's the mind don't pay it no mind it's good for figuring out things you know if you need to do some math it's good to figure out stuff. Your brain is very useful. We need our brain. But um, our brain is not us. There's a lot more to us than the contents that can be found in our brain. Hello, show me art. That's a dangerous name to say quickly. Okay, so in this deck, we're looking for creative inspiration, and it could be in in anything, right? So let's, uh, oh, this is one of my favorites. Loosen up. It's not so important to be serious as it is to be serious about the important things. That's where you get your brain, right? The monkey has an expression of seriousness that would do credit to any great scholar. But the monkey is serious because he itches. What can you take less seriously? And that is a problem with people. We, um, too many of us are brought up with the idea that life is a serious venture. But life is temporary. It can't be too serious. Keep it light. I remember doing one of those uh, Christmas shows, walking around the street, looking at people's decorations, you know, when people do the whole street like Christmas. I don't even celebrate Christmas, but it was really pretty and fun, and you can see the little kids enjoying the hell out of it. Um, I saw a tree that was decorated with cotton balls. I mean, not cotton balls like from the grocery store cotton balls like what grow in the field and they were upside down now I don't know if you've seen a, a real cotton ball it's a white fluffy ball and it's got dried up dark brown leaves you know you know what held the ball together like a flower that pops open well it's the cotton ball it pops open well, those pop things make it look kind of like a little skirt and wings and they put a little wooden head on top of it and they made them into little angels and hung them up all over the place they said angels can fly because they take themselves lightly and i never forgot that and since then i've seen it pop up elsewhere without little cotton ball angels but i thought what a great idea i grew cotton the next year just 
to be able to make cotton ball angels. Addicted to color. Oh, oh God, that's harsh. My, my ex-father-in-law was colorblind and um, although I'm sorry, it's been years, but I actually did sit down and try to make paintings that he would be able to appreciate more. It is, I'm so sorry, but you know, there are, um, I haven't, you, I'm not being colorblind, I haven't tried them, but I did come across a video with uh, colorblindness correction glasses. I think it is possible now. So you might want to look into that. I don't know if it's something that's still in experimental pay as, you know, stages, but um, I would think that they would get that kind of thing out as fast as they could. I always felt bad because my, um, my in-laws loved cardinals, the bird, you know, and of course cardinals are bright red and so my ex was making paintings of cardinals for his family, but his father only saw a brown bird. So I always felt bad about that. It's like, oh, just one day he could experience that color. I think cats have a similar problem with reds. They see a lot of reds as gray instead of like red but there is a level there is some wavelength of red that they can see although I don't think they're supposed to see red they don't have the eye cones or whatever that show red there is something that they do see though I guess we just have to try harder yeah, many years ago um, I don't know if it's still in existence but this little store opened up in Mystic Connecticut and everything in it was for left-handed people. And until I walked in there, it had never crossed my mind about the differences and the way things are made for right-handed people. And then I thought, wait a second, maybe that's why you hate picking up your coffee cup, which had something on it at the time, with your left hand, because the prettiest part of it is facing you if you're holding it with your right hand. So they had uh, scissors. Scissors are made for people with the right hand dominance. So I thought that was interesting. That's, you know, our perspectives. We all have different perspectives. I think it's so silly for people to think that we're all supposed to be alike. I mean, can you imagine how completely dull and boring that would be? How was that movie? Oh, I loved it. Me too. End of conversation. Oh, wait. Here's one more card. One more. This is from the Innovative Whack Pack. This is how I usually look when I wake up in the morning. Except well, only when I'm writing. These are pencils. <laughs> you know, I had this deck for at least a year before I realized it was pencils. I thought it was just, oh, yeah, me before coffee. And I didn't give it a second thought until I actually got the card with that picture on it and went, ah! <laughs> I was born left-handed. And my grandmother, coming from one of the old countries, was superstitious about that, and she switched me over. Now, it, I would have to say it probably wasn't that hard, because to encourage me to use my left hand, she let me drum. I grew up wanting to be a drummer. I was a frustrated drummer. I became a guitarist later, but I, be, I was a drummer in, as a tiny child, and she would just lay out a couple of pots and a wooden spoon and I'd go to town. I was like, yeah, nope, you can only do it with this hand. And so she just kept switching my wooden spoon. If I wanted to make noise, I had to do it with my right hand. 
Now, my last sister, because I'm the eldest of four, the youngest one was also born left-handed, but my mother would not let her be tortured the way I was. And I was so thoughtful of her. Yeah, the superstition is just ridiculous. And just, that's it. You know, humans are so full of fear about the tiniest things. Oh my God, he's got a left hand. He's bad luck. Don't let him in the store. Nobody will buy anything he touches. Yeah, people are nuts, okay? They make bullshit about anything. See, talking about storytellers and cards, that was one of the things that worried me about people because especially when I started doing cards for themselves because they couldn't afford to hire people to do it for them, but they were coming at it with the warped idea and their readings were warped. It's like, oh my God, don't let them out in public. I'm going to talk somebody into killing themselves at this rate. Okay. Things love to conceal their true nature. Oh, how true. And here's someone peeling off a mask. And that's even a, that's even a conceal because then there's another mask you can take off. So things love to conceal their true nature. Whether it is a nut that looks all nice and round and green and you've got to open it to find the wrinkly brown walnut inside. Things are deceptive. Be alert for deception, the very word. Deception is an omnipresent part of life. Animals camouflage themselves for protection against predators and predators disguise their intentions in order to trap their prey. In war, military leaders feign weakness to lure an enemy into battle or fake strength to prevent an enemy attack. In sports, teams disguise one play as another in order to confuse their opponents. A lot of writing here. In politics and courtship, politicians and lovers hide character flaws. Oh. <laughs> hmm. And in riddles, puzzlers delude would-be solvers into making false assumptions. For example, example, example. For example, how can you carry water in a sieve? Actually, I know how you can. The Indians around here, I still call them Indians. The Native Americans, the northern ones, the northern tribes, they knew how to carry water in a sieve or a leaky basket. In winter, they dipped them in water and let them freeze, and then they would hold everything. What is raised in Italy during the rainy season? Probably olives. What has rivers but no water, cities but no buildings, and forests but no trees? Is it possible that someone has disguised his intentions from you? What might they be? In what ways are you deceiving yourself? Okay, so this is on strategy, how to deal with things that come up in life. Be alert for deception. Now this would be more like, oh, geez, that sounds more like fortune telling, doesn't it? But I'm assuming that when this guy wrote this, water and what? Oh, I put it back in the deck here. Um, how can you carry water in a sieve, a strainer? Or like I was telling the story, our natives dipped in baskets that they wove, which would not carry water. They dipped them in water during winter and then they would freeze. So it would form ice and then it would carry water. Um, and then from water in a sieve, what is raised in Italy during the rainy season. So on we go. But when this business person and teacher created this book, a whack on the side of the head, he realized that people enjoyed lots of these ideas that were not generating themselves to initiate new kinds of thinking. So he created a couple of these more random ways to get information and make you look at things differently. Um, you may have come across it in your life. Uh, it was a good example. This guy who wrote the book in these decks, he did an experiment in class. He stood in front of a big blackboard 
and a piece of chalk and he made a dot. And he said when he asked adults what was that, their answers were boring. All of them were, well, that's a dot. Okay, it's a period. Well, it's a dot or a period. And nobody seemed to be coming up with anything. But when he did the same thing with kindergartners, they came up with, that's a smashed fly. It's a dog's nose. They came up with a bunch of ideas of what that dot, that little scribbled dot on the blackboard could be. None of them said a period. So we start off as children, we're very, very curious about our world. We're asking questions so much that our parents can't wait to shove us off to school because they can't answer every question while they're doing the housework. Yeah, same, same dot, same blackboard, difference in age, difference in point of view. Children are still the sponges looking to get more information and adults think they know it all. And then they get so impatient with the children asking questions, they don't want to share it. It's like, I don't have time for this. My parents had to deal with me. I remember, I remember driving my mother and my father so crazy with questions that one day my father, now he was a book publisher, mind you, but came back with a stack of freaking books. How and why this, that, and the other thing. It's like here, I don't, I can't explain it any better than this. This is why the sky is blue. This is why there is weather. This is why, why there, the sun goes up and, go, and down. I mean, it was like written for children of all ages, but my father knew the right way to approach me. He can't answer, or actually he could answer a bunch of things, but it was my mother I was stuck with all day. My mother couldn't answer very much. So books, books and books. But there too, you know, if that's all you're doing are the books and you're lacking um, too much, you know, real life one-to-one -one trying things out, it, it loses meaning. There was one book I, I will always remember because it was about how plants grow and it actually came with a little packet of mung bean seeds, little beans, and instructions on how to grow them. And it used the mung bean in the book to show all the different parts and what each part does. I thought that was absolutely brilliant. It wasn't enough to just look at a picture, but to grow it and watch it grow and have to take care of it and measure it and all that stuff was, wow, you're really involved. It's not coincidence most likely that I really got into farming later. So, I mean, not farm, farming, farming. I lived on a farm for 17 years and I just loved it. I loved it. No, no livestock, but um, you know, there's nothing like a homegrown vegetable make you into a believer. And especially if it's, you can do comparisons in, in rich soil that you've composted and all that and crappy, dusty soil that has had the life sucked out of it. And you see the difference. It's like, I will be amending my garden for the rest of my life. It's not a coincidence that my first book, Compost, is a real important factor in it. So, yeah. To inspire ourselves, to inspire each other, to me, that's a happy life. Well, you'll have to tell me where you're at, Roy. I don't know. You haven't revealed that yet. I'll tell you what. You do the talking and I will eat. I will have a sweet to go with my tea. Well, you said to your village, do you come from a farming village? So 
that was what i was trying to do when i lived out there that's what i was doing online readings and that's when i discovered some of the scams going on which led me to start my whole i'm going to teach you how to do this yourself so you're not paying your hard-earned money to people sitting on their ass and um no 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 more no than you they don't know anything more than you know so that became my campaign campaign 15 years ago Mm. With the Shetty name, I thought that might be Indian. Mm. I don't know enough about all the different regions. I just know that they are. I know I love your clothing, and that's no joke. 41 years ago, we had an Indian clothing store move in, and I was never happier. I am still wearing something I bought 41 years ago. It was so well made. The thing looks brand new. I can crunch it up into a little ball and throw it in a suitcase and wherever I go I pull it out it's like right off the hanger no ironing hmm which, which is the, which religion they're all interesting when I was 11 I was basically saved by neighbors who were Buddhist and they had a shrine room they taught me how to meditate at 11 that saved my life they did not give me religious teachings but they did introduce me to masters and um, yeah beautiful Mm. Does your pantheon include women? love it sounds like well thought out I read about Nagas. If that's how it's pronounced. Long time ago. I can't recall anything. So, what do they use? What are their symbols? Do they have symbols or art that they might wear that would symbolize um, what they're into? Mm. 
I would think it would be um, if it's like other pantheons that the snake would be associated with death, reincarnation, healing, and sex, fertility. Well, that's cool. I would think more than hundreds of years ago. hundred years ago is nothing. I mean, I'm 70. I'm only 30 years more than me. That's... Unless it was handed down in your family, then it's really cool. wonderful when things come to light like that, don't you? What's the deal with dancing and singing in the movies? Aloha! What, what aspect of that is your question about? I love musicals. Well, I do have a theory about that. They became especially popular when people were poor and we were dealing with various wars and the depression and People needed things to take their mind off their troubles. So they showed what they d thought were depictions of people at their happiest and at their best. Oh. Is it, you mean every India movie has singing and dancing? assuming that the singing and dancing is happy. Oh, come on. I had this down before. Yeah. And I suppose that you can have a, a song about that sad, but how many people dance to sad songs? I mean, it happens, but... Can you give me an example? Of what you felt was like arbitrarily thrown in musical and dancing. But I did see an Indian movie on Netflix. But I guess maybe it wasn't totally. If it was on Netflix, probably not a whole Indian movie. It was about Indian weddings. Um, parents trying to get the kids together. Oh, yeah, me too. Well, I go back to the 70s, 70s, 80s. Oh, yeah. I don't remember 
a specific song and dance scene other than, you know, them getting starting to get romantic on the dance floor, I suppose. But they weren't singing. That was a good movie. I should go back and see it again. Well, Maui is up early because Maui is in Maui. And Shetty, it's... What time is it for you? Are they doing less song and dance? 9-11. Oh. Oh, that's fucking hilarious, Maui. That's hilarious. The doctor began dancing in a serious moment. <laughs> that's great. Did it make you laugh when that happened? Or did you just go... That's funny. Definitely funny. Oh, really? They defy physics? Can you have an example in mind? That sounds fun. Like everything, everywhere, all at once, which I haven't seen yet, but I'm sure I'll love it. Sounds like it goes right along with my personal beliefs. these things. It's too bad they're so light. You know, it's like, you can just keep eating them before you eat enough to even make up one slice of cake. Which I guess if you ate the whole package, it would be like a normal slice of cake. flew away and directly landed on a patient lying in the hospital. That's beyond suspending disbelief. That's some true science fiction shit. And magic. Oh yeah, it's totally magic. I mean, yeah. I don't even do that in my books. And they have magic. I love it. So basically, in the movies being produced in southern India, are pure imagination. They have no limits. Whatever pops into their heads could be viable. As long as the heart doesn't sprout roller skates to get there, it's, it's okay.
I see it rolling down the street now. Just wait. <laughs> yeah, at this time of the morning for you, you need a cup of coffee anyway. Yeah. Did the cat get you up or are you just having an early morning? I need a cup of tea. This one's an hour and 45 minutes old. And I didn't even do any new art yet. Well, I did have an idea. I actually had a couple ideas. That's always the problem. I have too many ideas and not enough time Okay, I have to stop myself. Come on, girl. There's one dose left. One serving left. Three little cookies. Let's see how this is doing. Eh, not bad. Now, this did not have any silicone oil in it. This was just straight paint. And... Yeah, I used my finger, I used a line brush, I used a little rake. I kind of like it. It makes me think of a thistle flower. When they first start coming up, they're like kind of purple on the bottom and white on the top. Oh, no, no, earlier I put this on. Liquitex Gloss Medium. You, you use it as a medium to mix and also as a varnish. So I just used it as a varnish to bring the colors back up. Acrylic dries so flat, you know. Um, you need to do something to it. Uh, Maui. Well, that's what cats are for. Now, I'm not going to use the silicone oil today because I was looking at another technique that uses thinner versions of the paints. And um, some of them are mixed with white glue, which I do not have. Um, I ordered some little paper cups because I saved these the last time I was sick from eating all those little fruit cup things in bed. But for the pores, you have to mix really well. And the bottom of these has, whoops, it has a bunch of uh, ridges in it that make mixing more of a pain and harder on the, the paint brushes and all that. So, and we've got leftover gold. So I decided the smart thing was go ahead and just invest in some little cheap paper cups that are disposable and just move on. So one of the methods I saw, I watched like six demos from six different broadcasters and um, one of them that's really cool is creating a pillow of paint in the center of your canvas, like white, and putting a, an open-ended cup, like the bottom cut out of a cup, or a cookie cutter, you just put it there, and you start pouring the paint on the inside of the cookie cutter or the open, bottom open cup, and you let it just kind of move itself. As you keep adding colors and layers into the top of the cup the paint comes out on the sides a little bit here a little bit there and it it ends up moving you know like floating on the pillow of paint and then you can move it around you know um, but when it's doing that if you are not pushing it around it stays fairly central it looks kind of like those galaxy paintings all the amazing colors come out 
Um, so I wanted to give that a shot, make a pillow of white paint and then just start dropping the color on top of that. I don't have a cookie cutter. I don't have, wait a second. I might have a big ring. I had some tape that came on a plastic ring. I finished the tape, I kept the ring. I keep the weirdest stuff because it's always like something you can use in art. If not now, later. So, and there it is. <laughs> I went right to it. There it is. Well, I could, I could do that. Let me get this out of the way. Okay, so you see where the milkiness is gone and now you can really see the colors. It's way brighter. The purple has uh, mica in it, so wherever that hit, it's a little shinier. Yeah, just one of those weird things. It was just, it felt good to play with the color. Oh, let's see how this is doing. Oh, this is the first pour I did. And I just, I just love the way this came out. I like it any way you look at it. <laughs> now there, instead of using plain black, um, I used black gold, which was is a black paint that has a ton of gold mica in it. Okay, so this is yesterday's experiment. And I would say... Oh, it's interesting. Well, it looks like the, um, I, ha I wiped off some silicone that was sitting on the surface today. Like, I wasn't sure, but I rubbed it and was like, oh yeah, there it is. It seems like it dried pretty well. So that is yesterday's abstract jungle. The silicone or silicone oil is clear, completely clear like water. It's a little thick. Um, and this, literally one drop of this to one ounce of paint is all that's necessary if you do decide to use that. Now, the only reason I even bought it was because there were a ton of videos coming up that used it. And I thought, well, it's not a bad investment. And since you use so little, although some of them were like, oh no, it's 50-50 ratio. And like, I'm not using 50-50 with this stuff. Number one, that's way overkill expensive wise. And um, no wonder they're asking thousands of dollars for a big pour. But now they're coming out with, with you can do it just with water. You can do it with water and white glue all. Um, you don't have to use anything expensive. The water is the biggest thing. I'll, you know, I'll show you a painting I've got. I was gonna put it in the gallery, but I kept it out. Okay, this is an example. This is thin, super thin paint, which was left over from another painting I did, and I hate wasting paint. So I just added a lot of water. Um, I came back in with acrylic ink. The black is an acrylic ink. And um, it broke into all of these cells on its own. I didn't have to do anything. It was so watered down that it didn't want to stay in one big, even coat on the canvas so even though the, the canvas was gessoed and you see it held on to some of the color that floated over it 
it separated on its own. It did its own thing. And um, then I just went back in and started outlining all of the, where the bubbles popped. So that's what they were doing online, except they're doing it in a way that makes the, these things more organized, which I didn't do. I was just floating everything around to see what it would do and then trying not to move it too much because I wanted it to have a chance to dry where it was without further, you know, mixing of itself. Because here, if you can see a close-up, you can see where the colors started blending with themselves and creating purples where it really started out differently. But uh, they made their own colors and it looks good. Let's put this one down. So in thinking of doing the, the open, open thing, open cup style, I brought a fresh little canvas to the table. Now until I am really good at this, I am not going to be doing this on large canvas. Also, when you go on large stuff, you, you need a really good smooth surface to make sure it travels properly. Like it's a, actually better to use wood, masonite, things like that. But it's smooth. I can make this smooth by uh, using a squeegee to put coats of gesso on and then sanding down any high spots. So it, it can be done, it's just not worth the energy most of the time. So so all I want to do with this is um, I recommend painting a base coat on it first and then, then you can go on and start piling up your colors. So I actually put together a bunch of um, paints that were down to like just what was inside of a little plastic tube. Where did I put it? It's a whole bunch of them. I started watering them down already. Oh, right there. But one does a bat. So these are a size that came in a set of, I think, 48 colors. And I have the adult size in most of these. But like this purple, Diox, dioxazine purple. It's a really cool purple. Most people use it, but as you can hear, I needed a lot of thinning. So I have this idea for this bloom that really goes with um, the reds and the purples um, and some of the metallics like bronc just blowing out. I've seen something that really turned me on color wise. So I figure I have to try that. Yep. Yeah. It's cool. This is, um, if it was a line like a ruler, it would be for folding paper. That's, they call them bones. But this is, I think, made of plastic or something. This is to remove watercolor sheets from watercolor blocks of paper without tearing it. It was worth a dollar. I'm just not doing watercolors today. So I've got ideas. Now another coat of clear and um, that's kind of cool. Somebody might like it as a gift. So that's what I, I've always given my art away, but now that I've finally gotten to a gallery, I'm putting my work up for sale, but I'm still going to be giving away a ton of it. And this is one I was working on yesterday. I might work some more on this. I'm not sure yet. I guess what I need to do is like make myself a decent lunch and then come back. 
So, what time is it? Oh, it's 12. Look at that. Okay, it is noon. It is time to go. I will be back. I'll write it in here. Um, I'll be back after lunch. All right. Well, thank you for hanging out with me and sharing with me. That's really cool to know about the um, Indian movies. I think that's, you got me laughing. I'll be laughing later. So I'll be back after lunch. I actually had something frozen delivered today. I'll have to go take a look at that. Drink your coffee. I'll see you when I'm back.